Well, here we are, finally back to the Revelation study for Bible-believing Christians. It's been over a month since I've been able to get to this. Uh, it's, a, it's a challenge because <laughs> you want to go through it kind of and say, oh, this is how I've been taught and things, but uh, we're not going through it as a regular expository study if you're new to this. Um, we're going through this and saying, what can we learn today as Christians? Now, there is some things that you have to kind of say, well, that's what... It's what these verses mean. It's what it's talking about. We're going to hit a lot of those in this chapter today. Uh, it's definitely, it's not just a nice chapter that we can learn positive lessons for today. Um, it is, but it's going to be based on truth. Uh, I don't know if this is going to be a one-part study. I have three pages of notes, as well as some other materials we're need, going to need to be going through here today. But um, let's start out. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Okay? What are the waters? What are these? Go down to verse uh, 15 of the same chapter. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. All right, now we're going to get more into this as we continue in this study, but this woman, uh, she crosses national boundaries and she crosses ethnicities. Nations, uh, says there are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Okay, um, she's multicultural. So whenever you have people say, well, it's this has got to be the city of Israel, Mystery Babylon, Revelation 17 is about Israel. Um, Israel is not in every culture. It's not in every nation, the Jewish people. They're not in every nation. I don't even tell me that they are. Um, it's, it's America. It's America. Uh, well, no, that's wrong too. What about Roman Catholicism? They have their hands in every country. And uh, I'm just going to tell you right up front, if you want to make me angry, uh, come along and tell me that, uh, you know, Mystery Babylon, Revelation 17, is about somebody other than Roman Catholicism. I mean, I'll, I'll entertain people, say, well, what do you think about this or that? That's fine. I'm just saying somebody that's dogmatically, it's not Catholicism. It can't be Catholicism. I'm going to get real mad about that. And you're going to see why in this study. This whore, and Roman Catholicism is the greatest whore on the planet, uh, which, again, we'll see that through this study. She sits upon many waters. Many people. The number one religion in the entire world is Roman Catholicism, as far as numbers of people are concerned. Uh, close second to that is Islam. People say, well, you know, what if Islam overtakes Catholicism? Well, studied out, Islam comes from Catholicism. All right. Um, again, another big study. Can't get into that right here. But they both have their holy cities. You know, Roman Catholicism has Vatican there, the Rome. Uh, Islam has Mecca and Medina. You know, they both venerate Mary, and Islam does. They have a whole section in the Quran about Mary, you know. Um, and, of course, Catholicism, you know, they're, Mary's the, the chief god of Catholicism. You know, goddess, excuse me. <laughs> but uh, there's just no question. I mean, you can get down through and you can keep going through this whole thing of, of the parallels between Roman Catholicism and, and Islam. Islam comes from Catholicism. Uh, you say, but they've fought. You know, Islam and Catholicism have fought. People just don't understand that. They they think that things that look like they're opposed somehow are that way to the very top. It's the analogy of professional wrestling. You have professional wrestlers. They're paid. They're friends behind the scenes. And you get high-level Roman Catholics, low-level Catholics and Muslims. Yeah, sure, they'll fight each other. But you get the high-up ones, the ones that are in control of the countries and things. They know who's in charge. It's Catholicism. You know, again, I, had, I did a whole video, uh, Qatar, this powerful Islamic nation, you know, very, very wealthy, and yet they have a Jesuit school, huge, big Jesuit school right in their country. Why? But let's continue. Verse 2 it says here, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Oh boy, big important verse right there, okay? What's going on here? Well, the kings of the earth, 
conspire together, you know, and you could you could make that into presidents or the rulers, basically. But the Bible word here, kings, is not going to say in the president and the vice president and the uh, prime minister and th it just says kings, you know, just given as the the rulers. And I mean, these these people they reign as kings. I mean, give me a break. They they certainly do. Uh, are you know elected officials? They're not really elected. They're selected. But <laughs> but here's the key. You start looking into the, the, the higher levels of politics, you'll see people that are Knights of Malta, Knights of the Equestrian Order, you know, Jesuit. They'll see all these different Roman Catholic orders. Or they'll, be, they'll go over to the Pope and the Pope is bestowing honorary decrees upon them and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. What's going on? They're committing fornication with Rome. You have to be in bed with Rome, speak, you know, speaking spiritually, of course. I mean, they're, you know... I don't think there's any physical contact between the leaders and things. Although I could be wrong. <laughs> you know, wouldn't shock me. But the key to this thing is Roman Catholicism. When you, when you get into studying this stuff, you're, your mind's going to be blown. You go, well, there's another person that's a Catholic, and there's a person that's a knight of this, and a, that and that. And you start going, is Catholicism behind everything? That's what the Bible says. Whoever Mystery Babylon is, one thing we can all agree on, whether you disagree with me or not, one thing we can agree on is the Bible makes it crystal clear that whoever Mystery Babylon is controls all of the political system in our you know, day and time. We're going to see that at the end of this chapter. We can agree on that. Even if you want to say you know, Mystery Babylon is not Roman Catholicism, if you want to do that, you can still say the Scriptures are plainly teaching that Mystery Babylon, whoever it is, controls all the political system. So there is a central governing body in the world that governs everything. We can see that. And it's Roman Catholicism, you know, I'll tell you that from many, many years of doing study on this whole thing. It's the Roman Catholics through knighthoods, through other secret societies and things like that. Again, the Masons, the Masonic Lodge is subservient to Rome. All this different stuff, all these different things. Trilateral Commission, the Bilderbergers, the CFR, it all goes right back to Rome. You know, the old saying, all roads lead to Rome. Absolutely. Again, the Bible's true. You don't have to worry about this stuff. As far as, you know, I wonder if, you know, it's right there. But here's the key. Why are so many people just seem, they just, they're just like mind control? Again, you know, I had a brother write to me about this mind control issue, and he said, you know, I'd like to hear you talk more about that and get into some more details and things. Uh, you know, I've, I have studied some of that stuff and understand how, it's, how it works. You know, I'm not an expert on it by any means, but uh, it's definitely there. I mean, you look at the average person out there in society and in our culture today, where, whatever country you're in, they're under total mind control. They don't even think about the natural world. If they do, it's evolution. You know, it's all came about as a random accident at some undetermined time in the past. I mean, it's insanity. These people are under mind control, multiple levels of mind control. What's going on there? Well, uh, our text says here, the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. These dealings, political schemings that go on behind the scenes to get people in debt, indentured slaves like America, and give people fake currency, fiat currency that's just printed out of thin air. And you can inflate you know, the, the economy and and give people the illusion of, of wealth and things like that. It's all fake. What is it? The wine of her fornication. Hey, you want to be in bed with the Vatican? You want to commit that spiritual fornication with the Vatican? She'll give you all the nice little things, and you'll be part of the European Union or the or the G20 summit or, or whatever else. You'll be one of the first world countries, the developed countries and things. Yeah, absolutely. And the people that are in this system... They look and they say, I want my expensive house, and I want my brand new vehicle, and I want my this, and I want my that, and that becomes the all-consuming part of their life, and they can't imagine anything other than that. That's why so many people, I mean, try to talk to a drunk sometime. Guys walk around, hey, and you say, did you know Jesus died for you? Yeah, buddy, yeah, yeah, yeah. They can't talk to you. You know, I know. <laughs> We had, you know, dealing with, dealings with that Roman Catholic neighbor, you know, down at the land we owned there. And uh, I wouldn't witness to him when he was drunk. You know, why? He's not in his right mind. 
Well, so many people in our world today, they're drunk. They are spiritually drunk. Let me show you something interesting on this. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. It says here, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. There is a course in this world. Absolutely. It's what most people do. Most people think you are born, you grow up, you enjoy life, you play with toys and things, you marry somebody, you get a job, you know, or get a job and then get married. You go through school and high school and university or college or whatever else, and you go and you, you, you know, get married or whatever, or get a career and you work hard and then you retire and you get old and you die. What else is there? There's so much more than that, way much more than that in this life. And yet, it's that intoxication of that. And again, why do people get drunk? Because they want to escape reality. Oh, yeah. I mean, think about it this way. If you say, well, it's nuts. It's not, they get drunk because of the, the taste of the alcohol. No, they don't. No, they don't. If you could give somebody the feeling of getting drunk without drinking alcohol, they would do it. And if you gave them alcohol that didn't make them drunk, they wouldn't want to taste it. It's the drunkenness that people, that's why they drink alcohol to excess. Yeah, they're trying to escape from the reality that is this world. Because see, reality, you read over Romans chapter 1, it talks about, uh, we'll go there. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You can look at nature and you can say, oh yeah, God's real. I know he's real. I can see the hand of creation, his hand. This is better than any art that you'll see in any art museum, the most expert artists or whatever else, you know, would have to, I mean, just can't even come close to the design that the Lord makes in a butterfly's wing or a, the petal of a flower or something like that. The vibrant color of a rainbow after it's, it's raining outside. It's just incredible. You can see God in nature. You can see that there is a God here. You know, and I'm not saying nature is God, okay? I'm not doing that. I'm not New Age. <laughs> I'm saying you can see, hey, there's a creator. It's right there in front of you. Why do people try to avoid that? Because if there's a creator, then you're accountable to him. And so they try to avoid that whole thing. They try to go with something like evolution. Yeah. They want to be drunk with the wine of her fornication. Hey, you know, I can't talk about salvation right now. I got, I got to be getting to work. Well, why don't you just take the day off? Well, I can't. I got my house payment. I got my car payment. I got my cell phone to pay for. And Oh, hold on a second. Oh, oh okay. Somebody, I'm, I got a call here on my cell phone. I'm going to have to take that, okay? See ya. They're drunk. They're drunk with the wine of her fornication. You know, all the time. It's just it, it's incredible to me. And I, I know some of you use cell phones. I don't understand why, but, you know... <laughs> It's just like it's the course of the world, you know. So many people do, so I guess we all should, you know. I don't, I don't get that. I mean, how did people survive for thousands of years without cell phones? But you know, all the time, these cell phones are coming out. Oh yeah, the you know Department of Defense can tap into them, listen to you, and you can be tracked and traced, and they put an EMF field off, and it's really unhealthy for you and everything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what's the problem is? You're under mind control. You think that you need something that you don't really need. And if you're older, like me, I'm 42 years old now, there was a lot, long time in my past where nobody had cell phones. 
you know, I remember the first experience I had with a mobile phone was a uh, realtor that went to the Babel building I grew up in, the, the church I grew up in. And uh, he was a realtor, you know, big, impressive business guy. And he had this mobile phone, you know, in his, in his uh, sport utility vehicle. It was like back in the 1980s, you know, and, and uh, probably mid to late 1980s. And I remember it was so impressive, you know, like, you got a car and you're, 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 excuse me, you got a phone in your, in your vehicle? Whoa, wow, you know, and it had the cord and everything, you know, going down to, you know, big old phone and stuff. Now it's just like, oh, you can't live without one. Why? Because you're being mind controlled. Hmm. You got to get all your food from the grocery store. There's another good one. What about the huge quantities of, of, of free food that's out in nature? How many of you don't even understand that there's even food that you can eat outside? You say, do you understand it all, Brian? No, I don't. Why? I've been under mind control for most of my life. I was raised in the country, and so we would eat our wild blueberry, or, you know, well, some blueberries, but mostly raspberries and cherries and uh, mulberries and things like that. We would eat uh, different types of wild edibles and, and things, but there's a whole world out there of, you know, you know, you go to the store and it's like, oh man, everything's like GMO and I'm going to try to afford organic. Go out in nature, <laughs> you know, there's food all over the place out in nature, you know, and you say, well, I don't live in nature. Okay, then, then try to move out there, you know, and, and if you don't, if you can't, well, try to take drives out to the country and gather wild edibles. Learn the seasons when they come in, when they're ripe, go on out. I mean, it's just, what's the problem? We're under mind control. We have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. The kings of the earth committing fornication with Mystery Babylon and all this fake artificial wealth that we live in, this fake world that's promoted to us by Hollywood, that's promoted to us through the internet. And all oh, you have to have this and has to have be covetousness just just pumped into our brains to the point where you think, well, I couldn't get by without this or without that, you know? Yeah, and I see this thing, uh, you know, people, well, I have to have a cell phone because what if my car breaks down? Walk. What did people do for thousands of years? Oh, well, yeah, but we can't do that anymore. Huh? Believe you me, Christian. Um, we're under lots and lots of mind control. All of us. And it's, it's stunning to even think about sometimes. And I feel the more mind control that you get out of, you know, I got to say this too, it's very important. You see in the Bible when you see, you know, there are times when the Lord's actually speaking to people and you go, wow, you know, I've heard so many people say, I just wish it was like that today. I think it can be. I think the Lord can speak to you a lot more frequently if you just pull out of the mind control system. I mean, did you ever try to talk to somebody and there's a radio going and television's on and, and coffee machine over there making noise and the, the kids running through the room screaming and dog barking and a cat meowing and, you know, a little distracting. And the Bible says that God's voice is a still small voice when He speaks to you. It's a still small voice. He's not going to part the heavens and yell down like a... You know, thunder or something like that to you just to tell you something. If we could hear his voice, how much more power we would have in our lives as Christians. And yet we can't hear his voice because we're drunk with the wine of her fornication, with all the things that we just have to have. Hmm. Really something. First Thessalonians chapter 5, turn there. First Thessalonians 5. Yeah, I'll tell you right now, brethren, the more stuff that you can cut, and I, you know, I got to make this very, very clear. Don't get rough on yourself. I mean, you know, you've been saved for three months or something like this, and you're like, I got to be up to the level of sanctification of a Christian that's been saved for 20 years. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you don't. Uh, the Lord, sanctification is a process. It, it's going to take time. And the Lord will reveal things to you as you can handle them. I mean, He's not just going to dump everything on you right away and say, you've got to be changed now. You know, 
he'll have grace and things. I'm just, you know, so I'm not trying to pressure people and say, you know, you're lost if you don't believe everything I do and if you don't go out and pick raspberries from the woods or something. No, 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 no. I'm just challenging you. I'm trying to make you think in a certain direction. And if the Lord convicts you and say, you say, you know what, I could do that. Hey, I got an idea. I could, you know, this and that and whatever. Then do that. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 5 through 11. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep in the for they that sleep sleep in the night, and they that be drunken hmm, are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not, not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, and edify one another, even as also ye do. Hmm. They that sleep are you know, sleeping in the night, and they're drunken. Hmm. The nations are drunk with the wine of her fornication. I mean, you know, again, it's just like you look at prophecy, Bible prophecy coming to pass, and it's just like it's so blatant. And you're just going like you're smacking yourself in the forehead going, how can't everybody see this? I mean, there's signs in the heavens. There's weather, all kinds of weird weather stuff going on. There are implantable microchips and let's go to cashless society and all this other stuff. And everybody, you know, these big world leaders coming out. We need a world government and stuff. And, and you're just going like, why can't people see this? Well, uh, because they want to stay drunk. Go back to Revelation chapter 17. Pardon me, sir, would you like to get saved? What does that mean? Well, it means that uh, Jesus died for your sins. And uh, most of the people are going to hell out there. And you explain salvation to the person, and they go, oh, boy, I don't know if I'm ready for that. Why don't you put down the bottle? Well, I don't know. It all depends on how you look at it. I mean, most people I know, well, they're doing fine. For me, I'm, the more I drink of the uh, wine here, I'm feeling better about myself already. If I get saved, I'm going to have to give up my wicked friends. I'm going to have to give up this. I'm going to have to give up that. People know that. I mean, give me a break. Tell me, oh, oh lost people don't understand different sins and things like this. Please, their conscience bears them witness, the Bible says. They understand things are wrong. Now, they might not understand the full, you know, the gospel of salvation. I understand that. But they understand there's something there. They're going to feel conviction the first time that they start messing around in certain sins. There's something there. And there's something there where they, they know they can see a Christian. They can say, they're not like the rest of these people out here. There's something different about them. And people make fun of them and they put them down and everything else. And if I become a Christian, I'm going to have to be like that. Yeah. I mean, we're not going to go there, but you know, you can go back to the book of Acts where uh, Ananias and Sapphira, I think it was, where they were, you know, they lied and stuff and, and they dropped dead. And it says about how that the people, you know, everybody, you know, was wondering and going, wow, you know, amazing, amazing and things like this. But no man durst join themselves to them. The people were magnifying the Christians. They were going, wow, you, this is amazing, the power that these people have. You want to become one? Me? No, no, no. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very true for today. Verse 3, Revelation chapter 17, verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-collared beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Okay, what are these seven heads and ten horns? Revelation chapter 17, jump down to verse 9. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Okay, we're going to get back to that in a little while. Verse 12, jump down to verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. 
We're going to get back to that in just a little bit too, but I'm going to put something up on screen here. The uh, G10. What is the G10? The group of 10 is made up of 11 industrial countries, Belgium, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, the Netherlands, Sweden, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom and the United States, uh, which consult and cooperate on economic, monetary, and financial matters. So apparently they can't count too good. You know, it's, G10 is made up of 11 countries. <laughs> so, uh, oh, it's a far-fetched, oh, come on, you know. 10 kings receiving power. That's crazy. I never heard of it. G10 summit. Hmm. And they have the G20. It's you know, more countries added into the thing. But there's a G10. Hmm. Very interesting. Verse 4. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet collar and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Now here's where we're getting into the stuff. It's just like, it's obvious who this passage is about. I mean, there's just no question about this. First thing I want you to realize is, what does it say there? The you know, first sentence, the woman was arrayed. She's wearing these collars. So you can't say, you know, well, America, I mean, just, you know, this, this stupid Stephen Anderson little closet Catholic, he comes out, you know, Babylon, USA. Babylon, USA, showing all over the country right now. It's, it's America. America is mystery Babylon. Absolutely absurd. Um, just a basic understanding. I mean, if you understand collars, um, purple and scarlet is not the same as red, white, and blue. Well, but we have to spiritualize it and we'll say, well, the, the purple stands for, just give us a break, okay? It's not about, oh, well, uh, we can spiritualize. It's, a, she is arrayed. She's wearing purple and scarlet. Now, what church is known as Holy Mother Church? Roman Catholicism. What do her higher level perverts, what do they, what do they wear? Cardinals wear Red, scarlet, in other words. Bishops wear purple. Look at the big processionals and things like that. All kinds of red and purple, red and purple. I'm going to show a book here just to kind of prove my point a little bit more. This is sent to me by a brother. This is uh, the Vatican right there by uh, this Catholic Father, right there, Father Michael Collins, Secrets and Treasures of the Holy City. There, open it up. Scarlet. I mean, going way back. There's an old picture right there. Centuries and centuries and centuries. Another picture, you can see some of the purple down in here. See the purple and scarlet? She's arrayed. She's wearing. This isn't, uh, well, you know, the, the flag and the official collars of... No, she's wearing it. Israel does not wear. You don't see Israeli officials walking around in purple and scarlet. You don't see American officials walking around in purple and scarlet. I heard a new one recently here. Uh, you know, sister asked me, you know, what about Saudi Arabia? Where's the purple and scarlet? It's not there. Okay. Again. Purple. You can see it. But our text also says there that uh, she's decked. Not that she has a golden ring on or something like this. She's decked. She's covered in uh, gold and precious stones and pearls. This thing, this book is just unreal. The kind of stuff. Here you have these different crucifixes that the popes will carry. I mean, the levels of wealth are just unreal. 
See if I can find that one ridiculous thing. There you have this, this crooked crucifix thing right there, this crooked staff. There you have one, the white looking one there, that's uh, made out of ivory. Ivory, you know, carved out of solid ivory. Worth a little bit. Check this thing out. Clasp of, of Pope Leo the Thirteenth, uh, Gift to the Pope from Queen Regent Maria Christina, Christina of Spain in 1887. Diamond encrusted pieces surmounted by the tiara and keys, the papal insignia. Look at that thing. Isn't that incredible? Gold, precious stones, pearls. Again, up top there, pearls. And you get into the stuff. I mean, you can just keep showing these things. But uh, even the, the little robes that these sissies wear and stuff like that, it's gold thread. They take gold and they pound it thin enough to turn it into thread. And then they weave it into silk and things like this. Pure golden thread. She's arrayed in these things. I mean, just so much stuff in here. I thought this was interesting too. You know, a little uh, looks like the from the Wizard of Oz. Doris, these uh, golden or uh, ruby slippers or whatever, magic slippers. <laughs> you know, I mean, what what a real man wearing stuff like that and these little high heeled shoes over here. You know, and people come and kiss his, his dirty toe. Now, I keep showing more and more pictures out of this thing, but I think I've proved the point. What other system is like this? The Greek Orthodox in Russia? You know, the Russian Orthodox, I should say it that way? No. Um, the Jews in Israel? No. Um, Congress? No. And this goes back thousands of years. I shouldn't say thousands. Well, if you go back actually to the Roman Empire, then yes, it does go back thousands of years. You know, because Rome merged into Roman Catholicism under Constantine. Well, I don't know, brother. I mean, I think maybe we could make it somebody else. Why would you want, excuse me, why would you want to? When the scriptures are so clear. She's arrayed in purple and scarlet collar. And decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Forgot to show that. Again, what's one of the symbols of Roman Catholicism? The cup, the chalice, that they do their mass ceremony in. See if I can find the thing here. Just riches just beyond your imagination. Yeah, there we go. You see it? Right there. Well known. Get any Catholic cult building out there and you'll see them. Elevating the wine, the wine and putting the special blessing on it and all the other stuff. It's Roman Catholicism. I mean... I just don't get it. How some of these people can, just can't see it. Revelation 17, verse 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Mm -hmm. The ancient Babylonian system that came up through Nimrod into the ancient Babylonian government with Nebuchadnezzar. Then it went to the Media Persian, then to the Greek, then to the Roman, if I have that correct. And then the fifth kingdom is the part iron, part miry clay, the Roman Catholic Church is what it is. We're not waiting for the fifth kingdom. We are in the fifth kingdom. Right? And the Lord's going to be coming down and destroying the whole thing. But again, can't get into this uh, in this study, but at some time I'd like to do a, a big more in-depth study on this. The, a book review on this one right here, The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. Right there. 
This is an older edition, a paperback edition. Uh, the newer one looks like this. This is my, you know, reason we have a lot of double books is because it's my wife and my library together. Uh, but right there you have, this is the newer edition of it. But, um, you know, just showing a lot of the um, ancient Babylonian practices that have made their way into Roman Catholicism. Uh, see if I can find one here quickly. But, you know, this, this one is more of the scholarly um, handling of the whole thing. Um, you know, talking about, just to give you an example, some of the ancient pagan goddesses that, that had the uh, mother and child symbology. And you have today, you have Mary holding uh, little baby Jesus and stuff like this. Just ancient paganism, Babylonian paganism. But this is the real in-depth one. Uh, and if you want one that's a little bit easier reading, but yet still gives you a lot of the truth on the whole thing, you have Babylon religion right there. And I, you know, I'm telling you to go to these websites, chick.com. I don't, I'm not making anything. I don't sell any of these books. So nothing to gain from this, but it goes into, it shows it in comic book form. Really, really a neat little book. Very easy to understand. And, uh, if you want all the historical, everything and all that, you know, the citations and things and, and really in-depth study to Babylon's. Okay. And of course, Anytime you're going to talk to a Catholic about this stuff and some of the other things I'm going to be showing, they deny everything. Oh, the two Babylons was forged. It was fake. And the guy made it out. It's Protestant sensationalism. They'll lie about it. Fox's Book of Martyrs and another one, they'll say, well, that's not true. It didn't actually happen. It wasn't that bad. The Spanish Inquisition really wasn't that bad and all this stuff. We didn't kill millions and millions of people. And that's not true. Yes, it is. Absolutely disgusting, these Catholics will do. But the big proof, I mean, if this isn't enough to show you that the Vatican practices ancient Babylonian witchcraft and they wear purple and scarlet as well as the gold and the precious stones and the pearls and things and they have the cup, you know, um, if that's not enough to convince you, then verse 6 ought to be enough to convince you. Revelation chapter 17, verse 6. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. All right. Um, she is guilty of shedding the blood of martyrs and saints. And again, oh, well, you know, um, in John's day, well, it might have been Rome, but, you know, it's changed. And now it's America. Okay. Where are all the saints that have been slaughtered by the American government? They're not there. I mean, there's very, very few Bible-believing Christians have ever been killed by the government here in America. Very few. There's not been some kind of a massive, massive big persecution. But you study Roman Catholics, their history, they killed Christians all the time. Absolute, total, bloody slaughter. I'm going to read an account for you here, actually. Page 132 to 133. And uh, this is going to be very, very graphic stuff. And uh, you, people need to know it. You need to know what happened. Uh, we forget some of this stuff. The history of the Waldenses. These people were in northern Italy, southern France, and the Alps, essentially. Uh, an early Christian group that goes back the whole way to the first century, if you study the whole thing out there. Named after uh, Waldo, Peter Waldo, I think the guy's name was. But uh, these people existed for, you know, centuries and centuries and centuries. And it was very hard to get back into where they lived. And so as a result, you know, the Catholics didn't really bother them that much. I mean, it's a very interesting history. But they eventually were like, you know, well, you're going to convert to Roman Catholicism or else. And they said, no, we're not going to do that. And so the Catholics came in and started to hunt them down. And I'm going to read an account of what one of these things that happened. Um, Soldiers were sent in by the Vatican uh, centuries ago, is what happened. The soldiers were not content with the quick dispatch of the sword. They invented new and hitherto unheard of modes of torture and death. No man at this day dare write in plain words all the disgusting and horrible deeds of these men. 
Their wickedness can never be all known, because it, can, it never can be all told. From the awful narration of Leger, the guy that wrote about what he saw, we select only a few instances, but even these few, however mildly stated, grow without our intending it into a group of horrors. Little children were torn from the arms of their mothers, clasped by their tiny feet and their heads dashed against the rocks, or were held between two soldiers and their quivering limbs torn up, torn up by main force. Their mangled bodies were thrown, then thrown on the highways or fields to be devoured by beasts. The sick and the aged were burned alive in their, in their dwellings. Some had their hands and arms and legs lopped off, and fire applied to the severed parts to staunch the bleeding and prolong their suffering. Some were flayed alive, some were roasted alive, some disemboweled or tied to trees in their own orchards, and their hearts cut out. Some were horribly mutilated, and of others, the brains were boiled and eaten by these cannibals, the Catholic soldiers. Some were fastened down into the furrows of their own fields and plowed into the soil as men plow manure into, into it. Others were burned alive. Fathers were marched to death with the heads of their sons suspended round their necks. Parents were compelled to look on while their children were first outraged. Raped is what the word means there. They would use outraged back in the 1800s. Um, then massacred before being themselves permitted to die. But here we must stop. We cannot proceed further in Lager, Lager's awful narration. There come vile, abominable, and monstrous deeds, utterly and overwhelmingly disgusting, horrible and fiendish, which we dare not transcribe. The heart sickens and the brain begins to swim. My hand trembles, says Lager, so that I scarce can hold the pen, and my tears mingle in torrents with my ink. While, while I write the deeds of these children of darkness, blacker than even than the Prince of Darkness himself. Um, it does something to you. I'm going to tell you that right now. Just give you a little warning. If you study some of this stuff, the things that the Catholic Church did, um, it'll do something to you. It's, it's a really, really weird feeling. And I remember the first time I ever heard about the martyrs, and I just wept uncontrollably. And I said, Lord, I, I didn't know about this stuff. I had no idea that this stuff went on, that Christians had to suffer like this in the past. I mean, I'd, I don't even try, I'd, I try not to even let it enter, enter into my brain and start to imagine it happening. And I think about my, my son, I love him so much, and my wife too, and you know, and, and to see her being forcibly raped by Catholic soldiers and, and then see my son have his head cut off and that be forcibly put around my neck. That's what the Catholics did. You say, well, Brian, that was back in the past. Uh, no, it wasn't. Um, Catholic-inspired military forces, uh, when they start to get that blood, they will go absolutely into levels of demonic torture. It's just incredible. Um, I've read accounts of the Vietnam War where there were special operations guys, Green Berets and things like this, that uh, would collect body parts of Viet Cong soldiers that they had shot and they would make necklaces. There were guys walking around with ear necklaces. They'd cut the ears off their victims and string them up and make a necklace out of it. There were guys that would use eyeballs and, and other parts of the body that I can't even get into. Um, I've read some horrible stories. Vietnam. Uh, there was a guy, a Roman Catholic, named Richard Kuklinski. He was a mafia hitman, and they called him the Ice Man because he would murder people, and then he'd put them in a freezer and let their bodies freeze, and he'd keep them frozen for half a year or something, then he'd go and he'd dump the body someplace to throw the police off of his trail. And uh, I saw an interview with Kuklinski, and he had no remorse. He was just like, I have no feeling about this. He's a Roman Catholic. The wife and children didn't even know that he was doing this stuff. Faithful Roman Catholics. You look at a lot of these killers and stuff. And, you know, Kuklinski, there were times when the mafia, the Italian Roman Catholic mafia, would come along and they would say, we want you to kill some guy and uh, we want you to make it slow. And he would set up video cameras and he would torture these people to death in the 20th century. You look at uh, the Vatican Holocaust. I have it here, right here. The Vatican's Holocaust. I did a book review on this thing. And, uh, you know, this is uh, World War II. Not even a hundred years ago, right there, the body of a of a Orthodox Serbian 
Greek Orthodox. You can see the Roman Catholic boy right there. He's smiling. Decapitated body right in front of him. Smiling about it. Sick, disgusting people. They'd come into, into towns and they'd forcibly convert the people. Again, you can see it. And if you didn't convert to Catholicism, they would torture you to death. Murderous, horrible people. The Nazis, they were Roman Catholic. I mean, you can see right there all the Catholic bishops saluting Hitler. Franz von Papen, the German Chancellor, signed a concordant with uh, Pope Pius XII before the war. You know, after the war, they the Catholics got the Nazi officers, brought them out. You know, this guy here, this monster here, Ante Pavlik, the head of the Ustashi, the Croatian murderous Catholic cult that they were. A lot of his officers were Catholic priests. And uh, let's see if I can find the one here. They were Catholic priests, and they would, you know, they were called into battle. They'd change their priest uniform right into a Nazi, you know, or Croatian uh, military outfit. But, you know, I did a whole review on this. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but it's just, you know, there again, Ustashi soldiers cutting the head off of a man with a crosscut saw. Less than 100 years ago. And they still, under Bill Clinton, they were bombing the Serbian people again. This century. I shouldn't say this century. I think it was late 1990s. Make a correction there. The Roman Catholic Church. Uh, again, why was America founded? Why did separatists come here to America. Why? Because they were sick and tired of the Catholic control of the monarchies of, of Europe. And they came here to get away from that. And you look at the writings of the early people that came here, every one of them, without a doubt, is anti-Catholic. But a little bit of time goes by, and oh, well, the Jesuits came, and missionaries, of course, and they go out to the Native American people, and, and oh, we're going to help you and everything, and then they end up turning on the Native American people, get them slaughtered, you know, put them on reservations so that they can brainwash them to being Roman Catholics. A lot of these Native American people, especially here, the, uh, um, oh, what's the name of the Indian people here in Maine? There's different tribes. There's a Passamaquoddy and there's a, there's a couple others. Um, I can't think of it, but uh, right now, uh, I cannot think of them. Oh, the, the, the big tribe here in Maine. I, I, I'll think of it eventually here. But there was a, I saw a presentation this one guy did. He's one of these Indians. And he said he showed a papal bull from way back in the 1600s where the Pope was saying, go on over there and basically get rid of these savages. Yeah. They kill. They kill and they murder and they kill. And then they kill again and then they kill again. And they'll torture you. That's history. Where's this at for America? How about the Jews? How about the nation of Israel? They weren't even a nation until recently. Roman Catholicism. And let me tell you something. Let me just say this, because I know Anderson's little boys watching stuff like this, his little little cult following, the little active duty Anderson Snake zombies, I call them. I know they watch. The wrath of God is already starting to fall upon Anderson's cult. I can tell you that. I'm seeing it in the news. The wildfires, the dust storm, just a day or two ago, tornado hitting, all kinds of things like that. You can push God, but there's a time when he says that's enough. And these films that Anderson has brought out and his cult down there, you're pretending to be Christians, you're not Christians. You're in bed with the Vatican. You know, oh, well, you can't. Be. We're going to see what God does to you. The wrath of God is coming upon that wicked system down there. 
and your newest little propaganda film of Babylon USA trying to take the guilt away from the, the wicked Vatican. And you're covering up for it and saying, oh, well, you know, let's just forget about that stuff and things like this. Oh, yeah, they, they did some of that. But it's Babylon today is America. The wrath of God be upon you. I pray that God has no mercy on Anderson and his followers. If you're in that system, you better get out quick. Let me tell you, God's wrath is going to fall hard, and I believe it already is. It's just going to get worse. Makes me sick. And as far as the thing in there in Revelation chapter 17, verse 6, where he says, I wondered with great admiration. I did a whole video on that. Why did John say that he wondered with great admiration? Just to give you the basics of it, it's because Roman Catholicism in some of her forms can look like she's genuinely Christian. Okay? Again, you'll find that out when you do more research. You'll find out just how much Roman Catholicism is behind you. Man, I thought that was legitimate ministry. It's Catholic. Verse 7. Revelation chapter 17, verse 7. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. Okay, we already saw what the seven heads and the ten horns are. And we're going to get into that here as we continue. But uh, verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. All right. Now, I'm not going to try to get into some of the whole lot of this stuff real deep into this thing. But I believe that the beast is going to be, the spirit of this beast is going to be Judas Iscariot, the same devil that inhabited him. Let me show you that. John chapter 6. You say, what? what are you talking about here? You know, Judas Iscariot was a man. Well, I'm going to have to spoil your, uh, some of what you perceive as being reality here. John chapter 6, verse 70 and 71. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Notice Jesus does not say one of you is possessed with a devil. One of you is like a devil. He says one of you is a devil. Now this is God manifest in the flesh. There was no confusion on his part. And he is saying that a physical man, and you know, and when he says it, the, the disciples are going, you know, he, Jesus says, you know, one of you is going to betray me here this night. And the disciples are like, is it me? They don't even know. There's this guy sitting there, Judas Iscariot. He's been walking with him for three years, three and a half years, basically. Jesus is whole time being in ministry. This guy's been walking with him. He's been eating with him. They've been joking with him and everything else. And he's not even a man. He has the appearance of a man. He's got a body like a man, but he's a devil. He is a devil. Get a hold of that. You know, I've had this thing with brethren. They'll say, I don't understand how these evil people, you know, you get like the Pope and stuff. I mean, do they have no conscience? Are they? How can they knowingly be serving Satan? Whatever? Could they be devils in the flesh? I don't know. Pretty weird. Turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 verse 25 says here that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell. Okay, it's talking about Judas Iscariot. Now look at what it says here. That he might go to his own place. Hmm. Jesus, or excuse me, Judas went to his own place when he died. That's rather interesting. But what did it say there? You can go back to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17, verse 8. Uh, at the very end there it says, the, When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Okay, what is that? Well, 
you can make different interpretations of this, but I believe what's going on there is this is this devil, he's coming back again. And he was Judas Iscariot. But he is not Judas Iscariot when he comes back. He doesn't come back and say, hello, I'm Judas Iscariot. I'm here to bring, uh, you know, make this peace, this two-state solution thing that they're talking about all the time. I mean, Benjamin Netanyahu, I just got to say this real quick. Benjamin Netanyahu, I just saw on the, the news report thing this morning, he's in France right now meeting with Emmanuel Macron. You know, Emmanuel? Jews are looking for their Messiah named Emmanuel. Interesting. But he's over there meeting with Emmanuel Macron. Macron is a Jesuit. He's trained by the Jesuits. Again, look it up. I'm not making that up. People, oh, you're so paranoid. Oh, you're so paranoid. Look it up. You know, he's a trained Jesuit. Jesuits are the military order of Roman Catholicism, if you don't know. Okay, founded in 1540 by uh, Ignatius de Loyola, or Ignatius, or however you want to say his name. You know, they were created to bring all people back under the power of Roman Catholicism. And that's why the Jesuits control things like the CIA and a lot of the other intelligence agencies like that. But again, they're talking about this two-state solution, two-state solution all the time. You're not going to have this Antichrist show up and say, you know, I'm Judas Iscariot, I'm here to bring in the two-state solution. He's not going to do that. Not going to do that at all. He was, his spirit there was Judas Iscariot, but he is not Judas Iscariot when he comes back by name. And yet is. You see? He was Judas Iscariot in the past. He's not called Judas Iscariot, and yet he is Judas Iscariot in spirit or whatever you want to say. That's how I interpret this thing. Could I be wrong? Yeah, sure I could be wrong. I'm just offering a guess here. You say, but how does this instruction for in righteousness for us today? Well, understand something. Understand that when this whole thing comes to pass, you know, Christians have this, this notion in their minds of, of, you know, we should always be sensitive about souls and we should, you know, be willing to witness to anybody and, and you know, people can get saved and stuff. And that's good. That's the way it should be. But you also have to remember that there are specific people in the future that are not going to be able to be saved. Right? And the Antichrist is going to be one of them. And this guy is going to be a devil. Judas Iscariot could not get saved. Again, people try to use Judas Iscariot as a way to kick eternal security. And it's like, well, Judas Iscariot was never saved. You know, he's a devil. You can't save a devil. So... But let's continue here. Verse 9. We talked about this earlier. And here's the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. All right. This woman, this mother church, holy mother church, sits on seven mountains. Okay, I'm going to put a picture up here that shows you the proximity of the Vatican to Rome. Rome is the holy city, essentially. The Vatican sitting off to the side of it. But you have there... Uh, I can't really read these too good on my little thing I printed out here. Uh, Quirinal, Capitoline, Viminal, Palatine, Aventine, Kellian, and Esquiline. I'm probably pronouncing those terribly wrong. The Italians that watch this channel are probably slapping themselves on the forehead and saying, oh man, it's terrible. <laughs> Sorry about that. You know, but Seven Mountains. Now, you know, you look up most of the things, they say, well, it's the seven hills, it's the seven hills. Well, King James Bible word is mountains. But again, how does this line up with Israel or America? It doesn't. It's a city, not a country. Well, let's continue. Verses 10 through 11. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was, and is not, and even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Okay? Notice that this beast is, quote, of the seven. So it's not that the Antichrist is going to show up, and people are going to go, Who's this guy? You know, this is brand new. No, he's of the seven. There are seven that came before him. All right? That's very important to understand. I'll show you a verse that ties in with it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 